Okay, this is uh, should be um, some interesting topics has relevance to medical applications. Uh, we're going to talk about the physiology of of animals or how they maintain homeostasis, the uh, internal um, reactions and processes which allow for the um, efficient use of energy and um, the coordination between systems to maintain homeostasis again. So what is homeostasis? It is the steady state or ability of an organism to maintain conditions required for life. Um, this of course requires exchange with the environment because we need oxygen, we need um, food uh, for energy and um, to maintain our, our tissues within our body. Um, there is a connection, as we've uh, mentioned, one of the themes of biology is a connection between form and function. And anatomy is the study of those forms um, from the microscopic cellular structures and organelles um, all the way up to organs and organ systems into the whole organism itself. Physiology then is how the structures work, how they function um, to help maintain homeostasis. So in order to do that, they have to have um, a feedback mechanism, so be able to um, understand what is going on in their surrounding, surroundings and make changes internally. So in order to do that, you have, first have to have the set point or range uh, uh, at which uh, physiological processes can function. Um, the body must be able to detect changes from this set point or range, um, and that is um, called a stimulus. And then uh, in order to do so, there must be a receptor, receptor or sensor which detects the variations in that stimulus. The sensor then passes information onto the integration center, so in humans it's gonna be your brain, um, which compares the set point and the stimulus and um, then does something about it, has some sort of corrective action if necessary. The effector then is what actually causes the change to compensate for that deviation, for that stimulus. And then the response is the activity um, by the effector to move towards that set point. Now these can be negative or positive. In a negative feedback, you are pulling away from the um, set point and then doing something to uh, to get it back to that uh, set point. So you're kind of working against the stimulus. Um, positive feedback, which is less common, is a, a control mechanism that amplifies the effect of the stimulus. So these are generally temporary, temporary because if they continued, you would continue to have more and more and more of an effect. Um, but at some point there will be a stop. So birthing is an example of this. Once um, uh, labor starts, you have a cascade of events which kind of build and build and build on top of each other. Cervix dilates, the um, muscles start contracting and push the baby out. Um, and this continues to get stronger and stronger in stimulus until um, birthing is complete. Um, some other regulated changes over time include puberty in the menstrual cycle. Um, you also have uh, things throughout your day which cause um, changes, and those are called circadian rhythms, regulated within 24 hours. You sleep, your metabolism is much different during sleep when you're waking out and doing things. Um, this is a function of a hormone melatonin, the sleep-wake cycles especially um, the sleep cycles. And then uh, jet lag occurs when the, your external signals, which you use to determine what is day and when you should sleep, um, are, are out of sync with your circadian rhythms. So you may be up really late even though it's dark and it takes a few days before they reset and recalibrate. Okay. Um, 
this is a specific. This has shown to be statistically significant in Major League Baseball games where a um, team has to travel um, through time zones. Their circadian rhythms are off to their stimuli, and that affects their performance in games. All right, so we will highlight um, a few things, and that is the exchanges of gases with tissue, which requires uh, both our circulatory and respiratory system. So we'll um, talk about these two in animals. So the problem, or really the um, outcome, is that diffusion of gases, you want diffusion of oxygen carbon dioxide, right? You want, um, you're gonna have carbon dioxide building up in your tissues as a byproduct of aerobic respiration, and you need oxygen. So those things have to come in and out of your, um, of your uh, organism. And diffusion, so these things naturally will go from larger to um, smaller to larger, or sorry, larger to smaller concentration, but it only happens rapidly in short distances. Um, so some solutions to that are first, well, let's just have all our tissues close to the environment um, and the internal shells, uh, cells. The other solution is have some sort of transportation fluid, which is able to exchange with your tissues and cells, um, and that would be then our circulatory system. So there are different types of circulatory systems. Here's three different types of, um, of hearts and blood flow. We'll start at a more basic level. So the first off is, um, what if you just have all your tissues close to the exchange medium? And this occurs with periphera. All the cells are close enough to pores that gas exchange diffusion is, is good enough to supply all the oxygen and carbon dioxide they need. Cnidarians and flatworms have the gastrovascular cavity, which helps exchange gases, and this has a large surface area, so there's lots of exchange occurring over this very large area, and it's able to um, exchange enough gases for its metabolism. The body wall itself is also thin, so it can exchange with the gastrovascular cavity, um, and all of the tissues are, are thin. So um, this ha happens with cnidarians and nematodes, roundworms. Okay, so if you are close to the medium, such as in single cell, or you have a very large flat organ where lots of exchange can occur, such as with the gastrovascular cavity, um, then diffusion will be fine. The other solution, like I said, is the circulatory system. There's three basic parts. You have circulatory fluid. This could be blood or hemolymph. You have vessels, which contain the circulatory fluid. And you need something to pump it everywhere. So you have a heart, which propels this fluid throughout the body, where it can exchange with uh, respiratory surfaces and or uh, tissues as they need. There are two different types of circulatory systems. You can have an open one. Um, this is where the hemolymph bathes the organ directly, but it does not, not all of the blood or hemolymph is contained uh, within blood vessels. So arthropods and most mollusks have this. Um, hemolymph is also, also the interstitial fluid, so it does, um, we have diff or if you have a closed circulatory system, those things are separate. And the heart uh, pumps hemolymph to and from large sinuses, areas which are open and surround uh, the tissues. Um, um, so that's our open circulatory system. Closed circulatory system has all the blood confined to vessels um, and is distinct from the interstitial fluid. The vessels branch further and further, smaller and smaller until they get down into very small capillaries that surround tissues and infiltrate them and then they can exchange gases at the, at those very small capillaries. Annelid cephal cephalopods and vertebrates have this type of circulatory system. So comparing the two side by side, an open circulatory system is less efficient at delivering oxygen, um, is inexpensive energetically, which is why it's it's um, it's used by many animals, and it has a lower hydrostatic pressure, um, and you cannot specialize delivery of oxygen to different areas. So 
it an open circulatory system is good in small organisms that have very general needs and is very easy way in a, or easy but inefficient way of delivering um, oxygen and nutrients to tissues. The closed circulatory system, although it's energetically expensive, allows for specialization um, to different areas um, and is more specialized, more specific. So the circulatory vessels within our um, circulatory system include arteries which take blood away from the heart and veins which take blood back to the heart. Capillaries then are the smallest vessels where um, gas exchange occurs. Um, the heart has atria which receive blood from veins and ventricles which pump blood into the arteries. Um, we mentioned this before, fish circulation. It has a single circulation with a two-chambered heart, a ventricle and an atrium. The atrium um, accepts the blood, pumps it into the ventricle. The ventricle is the big muscular part, which then pumps it to the gills, and then it goes to the tissues, um, and then back. So it's just one continuous loop, and fish and sharks have this type of closed circulatory system. Uh, double circulation is used um, by amphibians, reptiles, mammals, birds, and crocodiles. It has two circuits, so one which goes to the respiratory tissue or the lungs, and another which goes to the systemic tissues. It can be three or four chambered. Amphibian and reptiles have three chambers. Um, so you see that here. And then uh, birds, mammals, and crocodiles have four chambers. So the amphibian heart has two atria and one ventricle. So the blood, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mixes in the ventricle, but because it has these uh, deep folds, most of the, uh, the ridges here, the deep folds, they keep the, most of the blood from mixing and allow for passage of uh, oxygenated blood to the tissues and deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And they do have a mechanism which allows them to divert blood away from the lungs when they are diving. The mammalian heart has two atria and two ventricles. Uh, the pulmonary artery goes towards the lungs and the pulmonary vein comes back from the lungs with oxygenated blood. Um, the aorta accepts the oxygenated blood from the left ventricle and passes it to the tissues. All of the deoxygenated blood gathers back to the vena cava and then into the atrium. You have valves which help to prevent the mixing of blood. The AV valves are between the atria and ventricles. And the semilunar valves are on the aorta and pulmonary trunk here to prevent blood from going mixing back into the heart. So the blood flows, um, if you want to start with the vena cava, um, where it has deoxygenated blood into the um, right atrium through the AV valve into the right ventricle. That ventricle contracts and squirts it through the semilunar valve of the pulmonary um, trunk. That goes then to the pulmonary artery to the lungs. The lungs oxygenate the blood and then it comes back to the heart through the left, um, sorry, to the pulmonary veins which then goes into the left atrium through the left AV valve into the left ventricle and then um, that contracts through the semilunar valve and out the aorta to the tissues and back to the vena cava. So um, the heart has a rhythmic beating to it. The systole is a period of contraction and diastole is a period of relaxation. You can um, feel this in your um, blood vessels and measure your heart rate, which is the number of beats per minute. Um, and also you can measure how hard it is beating and that would be a measurement of the blood pressure. Blood vessels have elastic tissue to absorb pressure from the ventricles, especially those close to the heart such as the aorta. Um, they also have smooth muscles which is allows them to contract or um, or relax to allow vasodilation, which would be allowing the lumen or the space with the blood to get larger. 
or vasoconstrict, which makes that get smaller to increase blood pressure or decrease blood flow. Veins do not have a lot of mechanisms uh, for um, the smooth muscles for vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Um, but they're very elastic and they can be affected by um, the contraction of muscles around them. So veins kind of rely on um, movements to get blood back to the heart. They also have one-way valves to prevent the backflow of blood so you don't have blood pooling in areas. All right, capillaries again are those microscopic and porous um, areas which allow blood exchange or sorry, exchange of nutrients, waste, and uh, gases. Um, the blood pressure decreases from the arteries to the capillaries because you have more, uh, m many more of these capillaries, but there's still enough pressure for fluid to be pushed out of the um, blood vessels due to that bulk flow, and then it returns back due to osmotic pressure. And we'll do a diagram like this in class. Um, capillaries can hold a great amount of blood volume. You can see this. Most of the area is capillaries, um, but the pressure drops as blood gets into these um, capillaries. And that allows for more gas exchange to occur and at a rate which is uh, sustainable and not going to damage any tissues. So blood vessels um, depend on the external environment um, and heart to help maintain homeostasis. When exercising, heart will beat faster, which is called tachycardia. Arteries to viscera, so the areas which aren't important for exercise, uh, such as digestive system or kidneys, will reduce blood flow. Arteries to muscles will increase blood flow through vasodilation and the arteries near the skin will vasodilate to release heat, which is a byproduct of exercise. Finally, we have our diving response. Um, so this is seen in most um, diving animals, especially uh, mammals. Um, and the stimulus is somewhat a decrease in oxy oxygen, but more so an increase in carbon dioxide in the blood which is a signal to your body that you need more oxygen. Um, the response is to decrease the heart rate, which we um, demonstrated in lab. Shunt blood away from the viscera, so away from, again, these digestive and other organs which are not important when you're just trying to um, survive underwater. Shunt blood towards the vitals, such as the heart and the brain. Decrease the metabolic rate, so you're just um, using less oxygen increasing anaerobic fermentation and using oxygen stores such as in hemoglobin which is within your blood and myoglobin which is in your muscles um, there's also some stored in your lungs and your spleen all right so lastly we'll talk about animal respiratory systems so the basics are you need a respiratory medium with a source of the oxygen that can be air or water you need a respiratory surface it can be lungs or skin um, and you need oxygen carbon dioxide because of cellular respiration, right? So there are uh, just like different circulatory systems, there are different ways of, of getting oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. You can do it directly through the plasma membrane, so this is done in our basal um, metazoans, new metazoans, the, the sponges and cnidarians. Uh, just exchange uh, through their cells. Sponges, uh, all right, so flatworms also do this. So similar to the other gastrovascular cavity and their um, circulatory systems as well. Um, the epithelium, you can do it through your skin, uh, must remain moist, which is allows for oxygen, carbon dioxide to transpire through them. Uh, and these organisms usually have a high surface area to volume ratio, so lots of skin in order to be able to do this. Uh, you can have gills, so tadpoles have gills or fish have gills, which has a lot of folded membrane and increased uh, surface area. 
You can have trachea, which are high uh, or large tubes, which just hold air. And you can have lungs, which are highly branched and modified tubes that exchange with the blood. So a good acronym, acronym to remember this is GPELT, Gill's Plasma Membrane, Epithelium Lungs, and Tracheal System. All right, so water. Uh, water does not have a lot of oxygen compared to air. It actually has the same percentage. 21% of the air in water is oxygen, but there just isn't very much because water's much more dense and viscous. Um, and carbon dioxide and oxygen don't diffuse very well within the water, at least from the air. So, uh, and it also has to move through this viscous um, water, so it's harder to go greater distances. So some loose solutions to that increased surface area. You can see that in gills, um, external gills. Um, this is of a salamander. All those little threads are uh, it exposed to the water and extracting oxygen and releasing carbon dioxide. You can have ventilation, so moving water over your respiratory surface, and fish do that. They have a um, structure around their gills called the operculum, which they can um, sh like move in and out um, to continuously have a flow of, of water. You have countercurrent exchange, which is a more efficient way of, of getting um, oxygen out. Um, you can decrease your metabolism, so you just need less oxygen, and, and a lot of fish live in these cold waters and um, are able to do that. Um, or similarly, a sea star can do that. Um, all right, so gills, outfoldings of the body are suspended in water. They can be external or internal, so enclosed in a space or just exposed to the um, water. And many fish and crustaceans also use ventilation. Um, sharks, however, cannot ventilate. Instead, they have to either swim or find a current in which they can rest, and that current will um, allow them to have continuous water um, over their gills. The countercurrent exchange system extracts up to 80% of oxygen in the water. Gills are ineffective when exposed to air because they clump together and they dry out. And so some organisms like crabs can breathe out of the water by having their gills internally and um, uh, also in an, encased in a water area so that the, they don't clump together. There's a little crab. That's why they can go kind of in and out of water pretty much freely. But at some point they, they will lose water and so they will need to be close to the water so they can replenish that. Okay, uh, fish again have these gills. These they ventilate, pass water through them, um, and they have countercurrent exchange with these gills. All right, air on the other hand, you have a lot of advantages because it's a lot higher in oxygen. Um, it's low in density and viscosity, so it it travels further, and you have a high rate of carbon and oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen diffusion. And so ventilation requires less energy. You can pass more um, oxygen over your respiratory surfaces. The problems, however, are desiccation. The uh, sunlight is dry and evaporation rates are high. And also you have to, f have to deal with gravity. So if you have gills, those are going to all clump together. You're not going to be buoyant or kept uh, separate by water. So some solutions to that, infolding of the respiratory surface within the body or and structures to prevent collapse such as supportive tissues and surfactant. <sighs> All right, so tracheal systems. This is a network of air tubes found in insects. The trachea are these large tubes um, and they have connect to holes called spiracles. You can see that in this figure here. These are all the tracheae, the network of tubes in here. Um, and they divide further and further until they exchange with their tissues. And these are generally fine for use of diffusion rates. And larger insects, ones that need more gas exchange, will ventilate by contracting their muzzles, especially during flight, um, where they're going to need more oxygen. So the question might be, why aren't insects the size of humans good? Um, and there's actually been some research done on this. It used to be insects were a lot larger, um, and they found that 
there's a trade-off between these tracheal systems and then supportive tissues for an insect's body. So if, if an insect has very large tracheal systems, then it can't have as many supportive tissues, so it can't, become, can't be very large. But it used to be the oxygen in the atmosphere was of a much greater concentration. So insects during those, um, those time periods were allowed to be much bigger because their tracheal systems could be much smaller and they could vote more um, energy to or more of their structure to um, uh, supportive tissues. And they've actually done some experiments where they have exposed insects to a large, uh, so an, an oxygen artificially increased in oxygen, and those bugs, those insects, are larger than uh, the normal atmospheric uh, insects. All right, finally, you have lungs, which are similar to the tracheal system, but restricted to one location. They don't go to different parts of the body. And it depends on the circular system, circulatory system to exchange gases. It's evolved in spiders, terrestrial snails, and vertebrates. Um, amphibians have lung skills and cutaneous gas exchange, so depending on the parts of their life cycle. Um, reptiles, birds, and mammals depend exclusively on lungs, and some turtles supplement gas exchange at the lungs with epithelial exchange in the mouth and the cloaca. So um, the cloaca is their reproductive and digestive uh, opening so they can have take water in there and extract um, oxygen out of the water and they can do the same thing with membranes in their mouth it's kind of crazy all right so a good question food for thought what are the mediums and respiratory surface of amphibians in different parts of their life cycle so they have eggs um, larvae with lungs and um, terrestrial forms uh, sorry larvae with gills and terrestrial forms with lungs. We'll talk about that in class. All right, that's it.